I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And welcome to Free Thought Matters. The Islamic regime of Iran has called our guest immoral and corrupt. Maryam Namazi is a former Muslim. She is now a secular and feminist activist living in London. She's a spokesperson for a group called Fitna, the Movement for Women's Liberation. She's also with a group called One Law for All and the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain in the UK. She hosts a weekly television program in Persian and in English. It's called Bread and Roses. So welcome to Free Thought Matters, Marianne. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So Marianne, tell us a little bit about your background. You were born in Iran, correct? Yeah, I was born in Iran, and uh, I actually come from a mixed family. So my mom is not Iranian, she's from Nepal. Uh, oh. My dad is Iranian, uh, but I was born and raised in Iran. And uh, my mom converted to Islam to be able to marry my father. So they're both Muslims, but she's originally from a Protestant background, uh, but raised in Kalimpong, India, you know, from a Nepalese background. So I uh, was raised a Muslim, as everybody is really, because you just happen to be what, uh, you know, the religion of your family. No one asks you, you really don't have a choice in it. Um, and it wasn't something that really affected my life very much because my family was quite secular. A lot of the members in my family married other religions and religion wasn't such an important part in our lives. So we had members who were very religious and they fasted or they prayed and some wore the veil, but many others didn't and we managed to get along perfectly fine. And when you were a, a young girl, Iran was more Secular. Open, more secular, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a dictatorship then too, uh, but if, and religion did play a role, but it played a much bigger role and it became all-encompassing mm -hmm. after the Iranian revolution was taken over by the Islamists. So how that's really you? when I found out how, how much of happened. a change it was, yeah. I was about uh, 12, 11, 12, 13, so there was that period in, in my life, so things just became so obviously different, you know. I remember um, uh, people spitting uh, when they saw me uh, because I was unveiled and I was just a child, you know, or just uh, looking at magazines and then seeing women's bodies being blacked out, you yeah. know, there were markers on everything and then executions on the TV. So things just changed. So uh, was that scary? That must have been frightening for kids to It was see that. very frightening. It was very yeah. fr and that's that's why I have this big aversion to religion. I mean, the minute it became a a serious part of my life. It just was so bleak and frightening and so much death and destruction involved, you know. You saw so, the immediate harm of a theocracy. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It became so, very obvious. And the other funny thing was, uh, um, well, not necessarily funny, but it, it was funny for us in the sense that I went to a mixed school at the time and they had, uh, you know, these revolutionary guards, what we call the Hezbollah, they are from the party of God, you know, they're there mm. defending God's work, uh, coming to our school to segregate the boys and girls in the playground. When you say mixed playgrounds. school, you meant boys, boys and girls. Boys and girls, yeah, yeah. So, um, when Hezbollah invades the classroom, you've done an essay yeah, exactly, on that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it was quite funny because they were standing in the playground because they hadn't segregated the schools yet at that time. And, uh, you know, they had told the girls we have to stay on one side and the boys had to stay on one side and we kept running into each other's corners and he was running after us frantically and it was quite a funny sight. But all of this was just, you know, um, very much night and day difference. And so were they like older men or young men or were they military types or what, what, how did they, they just came in and started bossing yeah, you Yeah, I mean they were, they were all military type, uh, yeah. armed. They came and started, you know, uh, tearing books, started uh, yeah. shutting down schools, started uh, telling people how to dress in the wow. streets, including attacking women with acid, with chains. I mean one of the slogans was either you wear the veil or you get punched. And, wow. uh, uh, this was a slogan that came in response to, you know, hundreds of thousands of women and men coming out in the street against compulsory veiling in Iran. So there was a lot of resistance, and people forget that. They don't see, remember that. And all they see is an Islamic state, and they keep saying that that's our culture, that's what we want, whereas in fact there's, const there's been constant resistance from against the regime now, from the beginning. Admittedly, this is a small survey, but every 
Iranian person that <laughs> I've ever met has yeah. been an atheist. <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, we often, I'm often asked, you know, what's wrong with you, Iran? Mm -hmm. You're so anti-religion. And I think part of it has to do with having lived and seen that night and day experience. But also I think it comes from the fact that, uh, you know, we had a revolution in Iran that was actually a left-leaning revolution. There were a lot of atheists uh, in the country, a lot of people who were critical of religion at the time. And so that sort of anti-religion movement has continued. And uh, you're, you're living now, you know, you've got 70% of the population in Iran under 30 who've only known an Islamic regime, but they are its greatest enemy. And so it's, it shows that that work is continuing. Really. Has there been a, like a brain flight from Iran? A lot, you got out, right? So must, yeah. a lot of people must have left the country. I think a lot of people have left the country. There's uh, lots of Iranians in the diaspora. My family is all over the world. Now, when did you get out? Uh, I got out in 1980. Uh, but when I came out, I just came out with my mother. My uh, three-year-old sister had stayed back in Iran. She's 10 years younger than I am. Uh, because my mom had intended to just bring me out to school in India, because that was the only place we could go. And uh, she was supposed to return, but we never went back. So in a sense, we never said goodbye to anyone. We wow. never um, got to see my grandparents again, my grandmother, a lot of my aunts and uncles. You've so. never been back. No, I've never been back. Yeah, but your TV you show, back. her TV show has been <laughs> back, right? Yeah, You've been, exactly. You, yeah. You're finding a way to get back. Yeah. It's in Persian. Bread and roses in Persian and in English. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. before we get to that, um, can uh, you ended up in the United States? You're an American citizen. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. now you live in London, yeah. and you've worked with refugees, and you've how many groups have you founded? Many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, diff yeah, quite a few groups I've either founded or been involved with. And I do think that they're all very linked with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, the right of refugees, you know, people fleeing um, theocracies. You know, you have people speaking about how awful theocracies are, but then they don't want to welcome those mm -hmm. who fled them. And I think it's important to defend refugee rights, but also criticize the conditions that cause people to, to flee. And of course, it's so linked to women's rights. It's so linked to the right to apostasy and blasphemy against Sharia courts, you know? So I do feel like um, it's not that I've done different things, but that they're all part of the same movement, really, if it makes sense. And so you ha you're now in London, married and have a family, yeah. and you're working with primarily One Law for All, is that right? And ex-Muslims in, in Great Britain? Yeah, mainly One Law for All, which is a campaign against Sharia yeah. courts in Britain, but also linked to the fight against Sharia courts internationally, and also the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, uh, which uh, you know works with people who've left Islam, who want to leave Islam, and who are facing threats, intimidation, not just in countries under Islamic rule, but also in many secular societies. So, and you're also working with Femin. Yeah. Um, uh, for women's liberation, and uh, very feminist-oriented, of course. But w what are the particular issues that you're dealing with in Great Britain that might be a little different from the United States? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Sharia law, is that a threat? Is it in being imposed? Yeah, in I mean, Great I, I think in Britain, one of the things about Britain is that it's a stronghold of the Islamist movement, uh, and so I think what you see there is something that uh, you will see eventually in other countries if the Islamists gain influence. It's also very similar to what we saw in our own societies in the Middle East and North Africa, where the Islamists start gaining influence, and then their imposition of Sharia courts, for example. You know, there are more than a hundred. Sharia courts in Britain and they're dealing with family matters they're highly discriminatory against women you've got faith schools where girls at the age of four are being veiled now uh, are these getting public funds and and they are getting public funds so as religiously well. segregated schools are funded exactly in Great Britain exactly and so uh, you know you've got segregation gender segregation at universities and you know, regulatory bodies excusing it and saying that it's people's choice and what you're seeing in Great Britain is a lot of the projects the Islamist projects of controlling citizens of controlling and managing women and dissent they're being pushed under the uh, auspices of respect for religion and uh, preventing Islamophobia whereas in fact they're really 
a project to control people uh, being couched in human rights language, which we see a lot of and is quite dangerous. Now, in uh, July of 2017, you organized a historic meeting in London. What was that? Yeah. We, got, we got to be we there. Got to so. go there. I know, it was so yeah. great to have you there. It, I, it had all of my favorite people yeah. in there, and of course a lot others who weren't able to come for various reasons, didn't get visas, visas. or were stopped at the border and things like that. But uh, it was meant to be, and it ended up being, uh, you know, the largest gathering of ex-Muslims uh, in history. And that was uh, really what we aimed for. We wanted to mark our 10th anniversary of the establishment of the Council of Ex-Muslims and have everybody there to really celebrate uh, apostasy, to celebrate blasphemy. It was incredible. It was called Conference on Freedom of Conscience and Expression, exactly. right? All over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you gave a wonderful opening talk there. And it was, it was a diverse crowd. There were older, but a lot yeah. of young people, yeah. a lot of young Muslims are coming out proudly. And you started that uh, talk with just a, a moving. Let's look at about a minute of some of the remarks that you said during that conference. I think it's important for us to remind the world that rights do not belong only to the religious. The freedom of conscience includes, of course, the right to religion, but it also includes the right to reject religion. Freedom of expression is not just for believers. It includes the right to criticize religion, to poke fun at it, and unmercifully. Expressing these beliefs is not a crime. It is a crime, though, to incite hatred against apostates and blasphemers and LGBT like the East London Mosque does in this country. And it is a crime to punish people with the death penalty for leaving Islam and for criticizing it. That is the crime, not the demand to live and think and love as one chooses. Well, that was a very powerful conference in a very powerful moment. Um, there were over, what, 200 attendees mm -hmm. from how many countries? I think it was over 30 countries. And we had people from countries where it's illegal and dangerous to be an ex-Muslim, much less an atheist. And now how many countries do they uh, ban, um, I think it's capital punishment for atheists? Yeah, I mean it's uh, 13 countries, 14 if you include uh, ISIS held territories that mm -hmm. punish atheism with the death penalty. So it is a very serious offense in many places. and to see people coming out in such circumstances is really heartening as well. Yeah. It's an important challenge and uh, we're seeing more and more of it because of social media really. The internet has given a voice to people who have been voiceless for so long, who've been suppressed for so long. And you do notice that it is really a tsunami coming out, particularly mm -hmm. from the Middle East, from North Africa, from South Asia. So, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the presenters in the diverse countries that were there? Yeah, I mean... People starting atheist groups or who have survived assassination attempts. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really... I think every speaker had such a story behind their activism. I mean, we had Bona Ahmad there, who you all know very yeah. well. She is the wife of Avijit Roy. She's a free thinker in her own right, and he was just hacked to death in the middle of the street in Bangladesh when he had gone there for a book fair. And they tried to kill her too. And she almost, you know, she barely survived really. Right. I mean, she and she's still facing... Well, she's lost a thumb. You know, she holds exactly. up you know, mm. scars on her yeah. head. From and I think uh, a lot of, still a lot of pain. pain. Yeah. Uh, and of course the trauma of, of having gone mm. through that. You had someone like Zainab al razoui She wasn't at the Charlie Hebdo offices when they were uh, killed, when many of her colleagues were killed. Mm. Uh, she was in Morocco at the time so she's the most heavily protected woman in France and uh, she's just a wonderful spokesperson uh, in defense of free thought uh, atheism and challenging religion and religious rule uh, you had someone like Fozia Ilyas um, she started the atheist and agnostic alliance of Pakistan uh, you know and the human cost is really great she lost her family she hasn't seen her daughter in four to five years wow. they've just because she's an atheist they she's not no longer you know it's a bad influence for her to be able to have contact with her daughter she's is she still in Pakistan no, she, she's had she to had flee. to flee she was uh, charged with blasphemy so she's had to flee um, so she 
she's one of the people there. Mm -hmm. You've got someone like Zehra Pella, who's uh, the president of the Atheist Association in, in uh, Turkey. Turkey. Mm -hmm. It's the first legal atheist mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. You had Imad Habib Adin. He started the first uh, Council, of Ex uh, Council of Ex Muslims of Morocco. And the fellow from Jordan, uh, Muhammad. Yes, uh, Muhammad Al Khadra. He oh. was a star, wasn't he? Well, and he he, he, he was, was going. Back, he went back to Jordan. He yes. wasn't just fleeing. He's going back into that environment, right? Yeah, he's gone back to Jordan, and yeah. again, you know, it's where you're not supposed to be an atheist. Where you're you're not supposed to be an atheist. You legally you could lose all your civil rights if you you do. You can lose your job. Uh, and just any of the rights that you have. But also, you know, he spoke of a case of uh, someone who was killed because of their criticism of Islam on the court steps in Jordan. So there is that threat for a lot of uh, people who came to the conference or who weren't able to join us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an amazing conference, yeah. and um, we have a lot of work to do, but it was very heartening and to it meet supported these activists. Um, yeah. Richard Dawkins and A.C. Grayling and others yeah. who were there to lend yeah. their support yeah. to. Uh, yeah. It's very important. And, and Dawkins, thing. of course, has had such a great influence, really. He has turned a lot of people, mm -hmm. hasn't he? And Muhammad al Khadr mm -hmm. was one of the people who mentioned that. He said, you know, he was about to be a Salafi, uh, an Islamist, mm -hmm. a jihadist, and instead, you know, he heard a video by Dawkins mm -hmm. and it changed his life. And mm -hmm. so it was really important for a lot of people there to have Dawkins there as well and Grayling. So um, before we talk about bread and roses, I think that a lot of people listening do not know of the obstacles that uh, ex-Muslims and atheists face worldwide. I mean, what, what is the situation today? How critical is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it's critical in the sense that, look, it's uh, punishable by death in uh, many countries where people are living and fleeing from. Uh, so you've got, uh, you know, people posting things on Facebook and being killed because of it that are critical of Islam, for example, or being imprisoned for years as a result. So it's affecting a lot of people's lives. Um, and so a lot of people have to pretend they're still Muslims. They have to, they're closet atheists, really. Mm -hmm. So it's like the time when you had to pretend you were straight, but you're, you were gay, you know. And now, of course, you've got gay pride in, in many countries across the world. But nonetheless, there's still a lot of persecution against LGBT people. Uh, so it's very similar to that. Mm -hmm. And in the West, you know, the thing that surprised me the most, to be honest, is when I started the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain, we couldn't find people who were willing to come out, because the idea behind it was people coming out publicly, showing their names, showing their faces as a way of challenging uh, apostasy laws. And we couldn't find anyone who was born in Britain who was a, an ex-Muslim who was willing wow. to show their faces. If you look at the original poster, 99.9% .9 are Iranians, you know, mm -hmm. because of our background. And now, of course, that's changed completely. But I found it amazing that people born and raised in Britain were afraid. afraid were afraid and so there's a lot of shunning going on which is very harmful I mean it's a, a form of psychological torture really when you lose everyone and all your family as a result to physical abuse really and people fleeing families because of honor crimes and and things of that and nature. It's all based on this really irrational notion of there's this deity who's so thin-skinned, yeah. you know, and that if you offend his ego, then people have to die. I mean, what, what, what does that say about human nature, that people buy into that kind of mentality? Gosh, I, honestly, I, I, yeah, it's, it's outrageous, isn't it? And the fact that religion is so privileged that, one, that their outrage means more than my outrage against mm -hmm. a woman being stoned to death. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty outraged. Uh, and I, I think I can control myself from decapitating someone, you know, uh, to, to show how outraged I am. And in a sense, it just shows how privileged religion is and how much uh, of a green light they have to do whatever they want uh, when they say that their sensibilities have been harmed. For w at least two or two and a half years, you have been part of an amazing TV show um, called Bread and mm. Roses, one of my favorite feminist songs, and Dan has a beautiful version of it. Uh, tell us about that and, and how you are getting that to women in Iran, too. Yeah, so Bread and Roses is really a very exciting initiative, and we've interviewed both of you. It's bringing uh, free thought and uh, criticism of religion, uh, taboo-breaking subjects to people in Iran. It's both in English as well as in Persian. Of course, it's broadcast via illegal satellite dishes mm. uh, from Iraq uh, because it's banned in Iran. Mm. So, um, but it, 
lots of people in Iran have satellite dishes because who wants to watch the Islamic regime of Iran's television? Do you do two versions? Frightfully boring. Two versions of it, or do you do a mm, subtitle kind of thing? It's, it's really as if, if our interviews are, let's say if we interview you, which we have, then we'd subtitle it in Persian. Yeah. If we interview someone in Persian, then we'd subtitle mm -hmm. it in English. So it's really the same program. We might argue things a bit differently in Persian or give different examples, um, you know, uh, because of this, some people won't know what's happening in Britain, and people in Iran won't necessarily know what Ken Livingston, the mayor, said. Mm -hmm. You know, so in in that sense, we might change that a bit, but the topics are generally why, similar. Why bread and roses? What's the title mean? Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It comes from the 1912 uh, textile workers' strike in the U.S. and the idea that we need bread, but we need roses too. So I think is yes, such a universal. Um, demand so not, not just survival but exactly but beauty love beauty, happiness love. Yeah. yeah yeah and I think that's something everybody dreams of and wants mm -hmm. now you have been the recipient the second recipient of the Henry K Zumach freedom from religious fundamentalism mm -hmm. award but you have also received I, uh, countless awards atheist of the year humanitarian of the year organizations international organizations all over the world um, what's next for you? Well, I mean, the awards, I, I don't, I think it's kind of, uh, I don't really think I deserve them because there are so many people doing so much greater work under so much more difficult circumstances. But I do find it, you know, it's, it's an honor, obviously, to be awarded, but also quite funny given the fact that I, I, everywhere I go in the past, people used to call me, you know, Islamophobic and uh, you know a troublemaker and a deviant and immoral and corrupt, and to finally be recognized by people who I I also feel very close to and who are part of the fight is something that's very encouraging, isn't it? So I think it's just we have to continue, don't we? We have to continue fighting, continue speaking up. Now, there's one other thing I would wish you would talk about a little bit, which is the censorship that you have encountered on college campuses in the UK, mm -hmm. um, where it's suppression of you as a critic of, of the Muslim religion and there's this knee-jerk, it's, it's a hate language. So, so what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? You've got Islamic societies inviting speakers who preach the execution of apostates and gay people, and that's fine, because anything is allowed under the pretext of religion. Uh, but if you go and challenge that, then you are an Islamophobe, you are violating people's space, safe spaces, and you are inciting hate and violence against Muslims. And of course, that's not the case. This is how the Islamists, our fascists, look at us. And it's interesting how so many progressives and anti-racists and so-called defenders of women's rights and human rights are seeing dissent through the eyes of our fascists. So, uh, you know, they look at us the way the Islamists look at us. And in fact, they're, they, they should be our strongest allies. And it's, it's hypocritical, really, isn't it? You want women's rights for yourself, LGBT rights for yourself. You want the right to criticize the pope and Christianity. But when it comes to us, we have to live within the confines of Islam. Why, why should we? Now, what, and some of the things that have happened to you, have you been invited by a group of students to speak? And then a group of Muslim students right. will, what, go to the faculty administration and yeah. and get you disinvited? Yeah, well, ask to, for me to be disinvited, saying that it violates their safe space, uh, uh, that they'll feel discriminated against if I come and say, please don't kill us because we don't want to believe in Islam. Or I that mean, you're violating, effectively, that's what it is. You're violating <laughs> multiculturalism, right? And yeah. We should allow all points of view. You shouldn't yeah. criticize any yeah. of these religious minorities. But what's interesting is multiculturalism never suits us, you know, the people who are dissenters. You know, they talk about diversity, but what they really mean is that it's homogenized cultures and it's only the ruling elite that decide what that culture says and represents. And anyone who dissents is inciting hate. So yeah. I make it a point that wherever I'm barred or banned, I decide I'm going to push and go and speak there. And if I don't, I'll go on the steps and speak. Hmm. Uh, you know, and so so far we've been able to um, go back to all the places that have tried to disinvite us or bar us. No, when did um, when did you become an atheist? Do you yeah, know? Remember? Yeah, I mean, was this I, a teenage no. thing? Was this a reaction to the 
um, a revolution? Uh, and, uh, the revolution was actually a, a left-leaning revolution against the Shah's dictatorship. So it was a really wonderful period for a few years where there was, you know, freedom of expression, people were having discussions. It was a very wonderful environment. And then, of course, the Islamists came and all hell broke loose. But um, I think it was a gradual thing for me, uh, and it was uh, a response to having lived under the Islamic regime. And I became a refugee rights activist, so dealing with, you know, people fleeing Iran and just seeing what religion can do. But I don't remember uh, a specific time. It was in the age of social media, you know, so. But you, were, you said you considered yourself Muslim because you were raised in a Muslim family. Yeah. But did you actually believe? Did you pray? Did you think there was a God talking to you? Did, did you wear a veil? No, but no. you know, uh, lots of Muslims didn't wear veils at the time. Lots of them didn't fast during Ramadan. Lots of us went to mixed schools. There was no gender segregation. I mean, our family, we celebrated Christmas. We celebrated Muslim yeah. holidays. Uh, we had, uh, you know, my family's married to Hindu, to Christian, to, you know, we had Jewish friends. So it, were you really a believer or was it just going along with the culture? I, I guess I thought I believed in God, yeah. you know, I, because that's what you're raised in and you don't question it until uh, you know something happens to make you question it I guess of course people have a right to their religion you know uh, just like uh, we have a right to our atheism but religion is such a detrimental and negative force in the world you know it's an idea that holds people back it says that women are worth half of men it uh, you know um, it punishes free thinkers and anyone who dissents whether it's with regard to science, whether it's health, you know, you've always got religion as a bulwark. And I think that makes it important for free thinkers to criticize it. And throughout the ages, if we look, it's always been uh, a criticism of religion that's been key uh, in helping uh, humans progress, you know, and that is a reality today as well. So to you know, uh, charge us with Islamophobia and racism and blah, 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 to stop us from criticizing Islam is just an attempt to silence us. Racism exists, of course, and ex-Muslims face racism too, but that can't be a reason to oppose um, those who are criticizing Islam. I think Islam. the hashtag of the conference says it all. What was yeah, the hashtag yeah, for exactly. Account? I want to be free. I want to be, be free. free. It's the human need, right, yes. to just be free yeah. from all of that. Well, you have done a tremendous amount of work to keep uh, women free and to try to free, free humanity, freedom of conscience, Thank and you. it's a pleasure to oh. know you and have you on and the show. And same here. It's been great to know you and work with you as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you.